Hi friends! Today, we're taking a closer look at one of the most powerful rockets in NASA's history, the Space Launch System, or SLS, a key part of the Artemis program. Artemis isn't just about a rocket or a mission. It's about humanity's dream to return to the moon and take the next step toward Mars. In this video, you'll discover how the SLS is built, how it was developed, and will break down the launch and journey to the moon through the Artemis II mission. So, what exactly is Artemis? Artemis is a bold new chapter in space exploration, written by NASA together with partners from around the world. The program's name refers to Artemis, the goddess from ancient Greek mythology and the twin sister of Apollo. Remember the Apollo missions when humans first set foot on the moon? Well, Artemis takes us to the next level. The main goals of the program are to land humans on the moon, including the first woman, establish a sustainable presence there, and use it as a stepping stone for future missions to Mars. Today, the program consists of three main phases. An uncrewed test flight of the Orion spacecraft around the moon to validate systems and equipment. A crewed flight around the moon without landing, testing both the Orion spacecraft and the SLS rocket under real flight conditions. The mission where astronauts will land on the moon's surface to conduct research and lay the groundwork for a permanent base. But none of this would be possible without NASA developing the SLS, the Space Launch System, a powerful super-heavy launch vehicle. How the SLS works Picture a rocket as tall as a 30-story building, nearly 100 meters high. It's powerful enough to lift enormous payloads, everything from the Orion spacecraft to modules for a future lunar station. To understand how it works, let's break it down into parts. On each side of the rocket are two solid rocket boosters. Each weighs 725 tons, about as much as a small skyscraper. They provide 75% of the thrust at liftoff, burn out completely within two minutes, and help the rocket reach supersonic speed. At the center is the core stage, the heart of the rocket. It's 65 meters long and holds enough fuel to fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool. It feeds four RS-25 engines, the same engines that once powered the space shuttles, now upgraded. Each engine is so powerful, it could lift several airplanes. They run for the first eight minutes of flight, pushing the rocket beyond Earth's atmosphere. Between the core stage and the upper stage is the adapter, which connects the rocket's parts. It transfers loads, protects equipment, and can even carry small satellites. Above that is the upper stage, which contains the ICPS, Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage a small rocket that fires its RL-10 engine once in space. Its job is to boost the Orion spacecraft into a higher orbit. Sitting even higher is the Orion spacecraft itself. It consists of two parts. The crew module, where the astronauts are, along with flight controls, communication systems, and life support. The service module, built by the European Space Agency, which provides fuel, power, and controls the spacecraft's orientation during flight. Everything except the crew module is jettisoned or burns up before returning to Earth. Only the capsule with the crew re-enters the atmosphere and lands using parachutes. At the very top is the Launch Abort System, LAS. It's a tower-like structure with a powerful escape engine mounted above the crew capsule. If an emergency occurs at launch, it can instantly pull the crew capsule away from the rocket, far from any explosion. If not needed, the system is jettisoned in the upper layers of the atmosphere. NASA has planned three versions of the SLS rocket for the Artemis missions. The first version, known as Block 1, can lift 95 tons into low Earth orbit, about the weight of 20 school buses and it successfully flew in 2022. In the future, Block 1B and Block 2 are set to follow. 
Block 2 will become the most powerful rocket ever built, surpassing even the legendary Saturn V that first carried humans to the moon. Artemis is more than just a flight. It's the first step toward humans living on the moon and preparing for missions to Mars. To truly appreciate the scale of this project, let's take a peek behind the scenes and explore where the different components of the rocket were built and how they made their way to the final assembly site. The core stage was assembled in New Orleans at the Michoud Assembly Facility. The solid rocket boosters were built in Utah by Northrop Grumman. The RS-25 engines were produced in California by Aerojet Rocketdyne. The upper stage was assembled in Alabama by United Launch Alliance. The Orion spacecraft was built in Colorado by Lockheed Martin. The service module for Orion was constructed in Europe. Once all the modules were built, they had to be brought together in one place to eventually form a single massive rocket. But how do you move such enormous parts? The core stage travels by water on a special barge called Pegasus, a huge NASA vessel designed to carry oversized cargo that can't be transported any other way. Shipping the core stage takes several weeks, the solid rocket boosters make their journey by train in special rail cars, crossing the entire country from Utah to Florida like a space caravan. The upper stage, the Orion spacecraft, and the RS-25 engines are delivered by truck. The Orion service module makes the trip from Europe to the United States by airplane. When all the parts arrived at Kennedy Space Center, the real magic began. Assembly. It all happens inside a massive building called the Vehicle Assembly Building, or simply VAB. It's so huge that the Statue of Liberty could easily fit inside, and giant cranes lift rocket parts weighing hundreds of tons. First, the core stage is installed. Then, the solid rocket boosters are attached. Next, the engines are mounted at the bottom, and the upper stage, along with the Orion spacecraft, is placed on top. All of this is done using massive cranes. Once everything is assembled, the SLS is rolled out to the launch pad on a special platform called the Crawler Transporter. It's like a gigantic tank on tracks, slowly carrying the rocket to its launch site. Now, let's take a closer look at the launch of the SLS rocket, using the Artemis II mission as an example. Liftoff is one of the most powerful and breathtaking moments of any spaceflight. At the moment of launch, the main engines and the two solid rocket boosters ignite together, creating an incredible amount of thrust. This system gives the rocket the powerful push it needs to overcome Earth's gravity and begin climbing through the atmosphere. About two minutes into the flight, the boosters separate. They've burned through their fuel and are no longer needed, so jettisoning them reduces the rocket's weight and allows it to continue climbing more efficiently on the core stage engines. At the very top of the rocket sits the Orion spacecraft, protected by a special launch fairing that reduces aerodynamic stress during the early stages of ascent. There's also the launch abort system, LAS, designed to instantly pull the crew capsule away to safety in case of an emergency. Around three minutes after launch, the fairings covering Orion's service module are jettisoned, allowing its solar panels to unfold. Shortly afterward, the launch abort system is also discarded. Approximately eight minutes after liftoff, Orion and the ICPS interim cryogenic propulsion stage separate from the SLS core stage. At this point, Orion is in low Earth orbit. One of the first critical steps is deploying the solar arrays, which provide the spacecraft with power for all onboard systems. The solar panels are Orion's main energy source in space. During this phase, Orion completes one full orbit around Earth taking about 90 minutes. 
Next, the ICPS upper stage plays a crucial role. Its engine fires to boost Orion into a higher Earth orbit. Orion then spends nearly a full day in high Earth orbit. This deliberate pause allows engineers to thoroughly test the spacecraft systems in real space conditions, closely simulating a lunar mission. During this time, systems like life support, communication, navigation, attitude control, and power supply are carefully monitored. These tests are critical because once Orion leaves Earth orbit, rescuing the crew becomes much harder if something goes wrong. After completing all system checks, the Orion spacecraft separates from the rocket's upper stage. The expended ICPS stage and the Orion stage adapter, left behind in space, become targets for a critical part of the mission, a proximity operations demonstration. During this demonstration, the astronauts manually approach and back away from the target, using onboard cameras and visual cues through Orion's windows. The test offers a unique opportunity to assess how well the spacecraft's control systems and navigation equipment perform in space. This phase is crucial. It not only gives the crew practical experience with manual flying, but also provides engineers with valuable data on Orion's real-world performance in orbit. After completing all system checks and tests, one of the most critical moments of the mission begins. The Translunar Injection Maneuver. This is a powerful engine burn that propels Orion out of Earth's orbit and sets it on course for the Moon. If the trajectory is calculated perfectly, the spacecraft will reach its destination. But even the slightest miscalculation could mean missing the target, making this one of the most nerve-wracking moments of the mission. But plotting the right course isn't the only challenge the crew will face. In deep space, there's no protective magnetic field like Earth's, and radiation becomes a serious threat to astronaut health. Solar flares and cosmic rays bombard the spacecraft like an invisible rain of tiny arrows, capable of causing real harm to the human body. Although Orion is shielded against space radiation and onboard sensors constantly monitor radiation levels, the spacecraft is equipped with a shelter area where the crew can take refuge during solar storms. During the flight to the moon, the crew will also conduct emergency drills to prepare for unexpected situations. Imagine yourself floating near the window, watching as the moon grows larger with each passing hour, eventually filling the entire view. Another crucial part of the mission is passing around the far side of the moon. During this phase, Orion will completely lose contact with Earth and operate autonomously for about 30 to 40 minutes. Meanwhile, its cameras and instruments will gather invaluable data about the lunar surface to support future missions. This information will help identify the best locations for building a permanent base on the Moon. After completing its flyby of the Moon, Orion begins its journey back to Earth. But this is no simple task. Bringing the spacecraft home safely requires precise calculations and carefully executed maneuvers. As Orion approaches Earth, it's traveling at an incredible speed of 11 kilometers per second, about 30 times faster than the speed of sound. If it were a car, you would flash through an entire city in just a fraction of a second. Before re-entering the atmosphere, the Orion capsule separates from the service module. Using its maneuvering thrusters, the astronauts reorient the capsule so that the heat shield faces forward. The trajectory must be calculated with extreme accuracy to ensure the spacecraft enters Earth's atmosphere at just the right angle, about 6 to 7 degrees relative to the horizon. Even a tiny miscalculation could be disastrous. A steep angle could cause the capsule to burn up, while a shallow one could send it skipping off the atmosphere and back into space. 
As Orion plunges into the denser layers of the atmosphere, it rapidly decelerates and heats up, causing a temporary communications blackout. To protect the crew, Orion is equipped with a powerful heat shield that absorbs most of the extreme thermal energy. The surface of the capsule heats up to around 2,700 degrees Celsius, glowing like a meteor as it sheds the intense heat. While inside, the cabin stays at a comfortable 20 to 25 degrees Celsius. As the spacecraft slows down, the astronauts experience forces of 4 to 6 G. But what do those numbers really mean? Imagine an average person weighing 60 kilograms. Under 6 G, that person would feel like they weighed 300 kilograms, like riding a roller coaster, but five times more intense. After passing through the dense layers of the atmosphere and reaching the proper altitude, Orion deploys its complex parachute system. The first set of three parachutes separates the protective heat shield exposing the main parachutes underneath. Next, two small drogue parachutes deploy to slow the capsule down and stabilize its orientation. At an altitude of about 3,000 meters, three pilot chutes release the three main parachutes, which slow the capsule from around 200 kilometers per hour to just 30 kilometers per hour. Roughly 16 minutes after re-entry, Orion splashes down about 100 kilometers off the coast of California. The crew recovery process takes approximately two to three hours. Even before splashdown, NASA specialists, along with teams from the US Navy and Air Force, are already standing by near the expected landing zone. As soon as the capsule touches the water, ships and helicopters move in. Helicopters provide rapid evacuation for the astronauts, while ships recover the capsule and bring it aboard. The entire operation is tightly coordinated and extensively rehearsed to minimize the amount of time the crew spends in the water. Immediately after evacuation, the astronauts undergo a series of medical evaluations to detect any health issues caused by prolonged time in space or disturbances to their vestibular system. Thanks for watching. Support the channel by subscribing. It inspires me to create even more great content.